Okay, I'm going to uh, uh, turn the, the mic over to Evan Scott. Is he over there? Who's going to uh, chair the next session? Evan? Hello. Oh. Hello, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to session two, uh, Nanotechnology and Regenerative Medicine. My name is Professor Evan Scott, and it's my pleasure to introduce our session speakers, Professor Sam Stoop and Guillermo Amir. Professor Stoop is the Board of Trustees Professor of Materials Science and Engineering, Chemistry, Medicine, and Biomedical Engineering. He is the Director of the Simpson Quarry Institute for Bio Nanotechnology. He also leads the Center for Bioinspired Energy Science, which is an Energy Frontiers Research Center funded by the U.S. Department of Energy. Professor Stoops was born and raised in Costa Rica before coming to the United States and completing his undergraduate degree in chemistry at UCLA and his PhD in material science and engineering at Northwestern. Upon graduation, he joined the Northwestern faculty before moving to the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign in 1980. Uh, he returned home to Northwestern in 1999 and has been with us ever since. His research focuses on supermolecular self-assembly and the creation of nanomaterials and structures with unique biological activities or properties and those that emulate living systems. His very recent work focuses on supermolecular dynamics and his role in driving the creation of robotic soft matter and optimizing bioactivity. Our second speaker is Professor Amir. Uh, he is the Daniel Hale Williams Professor of Biomedical Engineering and Surgery at the McCormick School of Engineering and the Department of Surgery at the Feinberg School of Medicine. He is the founding director of the Center for Advanced Regenerative Engineering, also known as CARE. Professor Amir received his undergraduate degree in chemical engineering at the University of Texas, Austin, and his PhD in chemical and biomedical engineering at MIT. Professor Amir's research focuses on developing biomaterials and nanotechnology for regenerative engineering, medical devices, excuse me, <laughs> uh, and drug and cell delivery applications. He is the deputy editor of Science Advances a member of the Board of Directors of the Regenerative Engineering Society, Chair of the College of Fellows of the American Institute of Medical and Biological Engineering, and a member of the Scientific Advisory Board of Acuative Technologies, uh, which is a company that is bringing one of his te technologies to the musculoskeletal surgery market. So please join me uh, in welcoming our session two speakers, Professor Stupin Amir. Uh, I mean, we ask that you please hold your applause um, and your questions until both speakers have, have completed their talks. Thank you. Thank you, Evan, for the introduction. Uh, good morning, everybody. Congratulations, chat, for 20 years of the IIN, such a successful operation on our campus. So I'm going to be uh, talking to you about regenerative medicine. And uh, so this is basically a new field of medicine. And the objective is to lengthen your health span. And what is your health span means the years of your life that you remain, let's say, fully or mostly uh, functional, both mentally and physically. This is huge. It's extremely important to the world as we move forward. It's a great uh, economic opportunity, of course, but not to mention uh, the contribution to high quality of life for people on the planet. So this is a field that, that had a beginning uh, where uh, maybe 75, nearly 100 years ago, people started making implants out of plastics and metals and ceramics, putting them in different parts of the body to try to repair, uh, replace structure, replace function. The future of the field is shown here on the left side. Uh, and here, what we, what we want to do, basically, is to uh, regenerate all tissues of your body. And some of the tissues in your body are very difficult uh, to regenerate. Now, I'm going to be speaking with Guillermo Amir, who you will hear. Uh, he also is interested in this field. We use very different approaches to the subject. Uh, and so we have one thing in common, which is we are both interested in regenerative medicine. But the other thing we have in common, uh, if I could just go back. 
oops, yeah, uh, is that we were born in neighboring countries in Central America. I am from uh, Costa Rica. Uh, you see it here. And then Guillermo is from Panama. So these are two neighboring countries. And so we share that in common. Well, we're going to give the lecture in Spanish. <laughs> but uh, we decided that it was not a good idea. OK. So, so what is really missing, then, uh, to increase your health span. There are lots of things that are missing. Uh, for example, we still need better recovery uh, after heart attacks. We need better recovery after strokes. We need to prevent neurodegenerative diseases. We all know and are afraid of Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and all the other diseases. Of course, we need to cure cancer. Uh, that has received a lot of attention. Uh, the privilege of living with out pain and free movement throughout your life uh, or through most of your life is extremely important. We still don't have that. Uh, we have to also uh, prevent paralysis. This is a devastating uh, condition, human condition, uh, when an accident uh, leads to paralysis and you are confined to a wheelchair the rest of your life. And also, uh, we have to slow down aging processes, we would all like that, and we would like to uh, have new solutions for kidney failure, which is really a very important problem at the end of your life, uh, alternatives to dialysis, for example, and, and also controlling uh, brain plasticity and, and mental health and dementia. I'm sure this will come in this century, uh, sort of the century of the brain, and, and there will be lots of exciting things. Many of these things that are listed here uh, will depend deeply on advances in regenerative medicine, many of them. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, what, what we do is, uh, in, what we did in my lab here at Northwestern was to create nanostructures. And these nanostructures are supramolecular because they are made of, say, 10,000, 100,000 molecules. And so we developed molecules that were programmed uh, uh, to self-assemble into these nanofibers, about 10 nanometers in diameter, microns in length. And we were the first ones to create this type of coat uh, with molecules to create the assemblies. One of the targets, the functional targets for these uh, nanostructures was, in fact, uh, that was you know, the thing I wanted to do back in 2001, is to use them for regenerative medicine. That is to make them bioactive so that they can uh, talk to cells. And in fact, as you see here on the slide, uh, the molecule, which is, is very uh, complex to some extent, is made up of peptides and lipids. Uh, these molecules basically have a determinus, they have a signal that talks to cells and then those signals get displaced in, in an incredibly high density of about 10 to the 15 per square centimeter uh, to receptors on cells. And those signals then uh, basically trigger regeneration of tissues uh, anywhere in your body. And you can, of course, target them for the specific receptors that we need to address. We've published a lot on the subject. Uh, we've made a lot of advances uh, in, 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 uh, in the last few years. And so basically uh, what we are going to show you now is uh, what they look like. So this is a cryo-electron micrograph, and, uh, which is a lot better than the one Terry showed earlier that at the beginning. We have improved a lot in our techniques. And so you see there the nanofibers, which are about 10 nanometers in diameter. Why the nanofibers? Well, because every cell in your body, maybe except the, your blood cells, is surrounded by something called the extracellular matrix, and the architecture of that matrix are nanofibers. So this is, this is where the idea came from to mimic that architecture and then install the signals to talk to the cells, which is the way that during development, you grow bone and cartilage and kidneys and, and brain. So we wanted to mimic the extracellular matrix with these nano 
fibers, and, and they produce materials which are very bioactive. So the way they signal, as you see them here, they signal by basically uh, having these, uh, th these uh, signals distributed throughout the nanofiber. Here are the receptors on the cell surface, and uh, they just basically uh, go directly to specific receptors, and we manipulate that molecularly, of course. And then when those signals touch the receptors, something good happens. Typically, genes get expressed that are needed in order to regenerate the tissues. Okay, so uh, the, the, the first thing that, that we have developed, which is pretty close to the clinic now, is, is out of a company I started here at Northwestern Antics Bio, and this material is, is, uh, is, is basically, as you can see it here on the, on the slide, it's a putty. It looks like the, the things that, that, pe that children play with. Well, these nanofibers are integrated into this putty, and this is the most bioactive material I know in, in, in preclinical models to grow bone wherever it is needed. So the company is developing it for spinal fusion surgeries. And then the next one, we will do other nanofibers that will be used for cartilage formation. And cartilage is, of course, critical for this issue of the, having movement, physical movement and ability, physical abilities throughout your life. Okay, but so the main subject, though, is the brain, and this is the subject of my, of, of my talk, is this is the next big thing, is how do you do regeneration in the brain and in the spinal cord, the central nervous system? Cartilage doesn't grow again after you are 18. The brain is even worse. The brain and the spinal cord is, 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 uh, is a very privileged environment, of course, is the, the site of our intelligence, and uh, regeneration in that tissue is very, very challenging. And this is important because you want to address not just paralysis, if you damage the spinal cord and you lose movement completely, you become paralyzed, but also if you have a brain injury or if you have a stroke, you need to repair the brain, you need to repair tissues in the brain, and if you have a neurodegenerative disease as well. So what we did is uh, we made a discovery, and this was published uh, in November last year, uh, and that we, 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 we learned that basically, uh, and, and this was targeted for spinal cord injury, that the motion of those molecules that make up the fiber, the nanostructure, that motion uh, is critical to their ability of our systems to signal the cells in regeneration. This had never been reported, it had never been observed, and so we were pioneers in this, in this, I mean, in, in this area, and it was a true discovery. It was, it was something that happened in our laboratory over the course of five years, and then we reported it for the first time last November. The, the press uh, named this the dancing molecules, and so if you Google dancing molecules with my name, you'll see it was like a, you know, a, a big uh, thing on the dancing molecules. I receive daily emails about the dancing molecules you know, from everywhere in the world. But, and, and, and the press attention that this got and is, is, a, is a marker, is an indication of how important is spinal cord injury uh, to the world because it's a devastating injury, not just for the person, but for the family around the person. So what is this motion thing? Well, I think an animation is, is the most effective way to show it. There, here is my fiber, okay? You, you can see it. You see these orange things sticking out. You see a silver background, right? And so this is the motion that we're talking. This is the dancing of the molecules. So inside that fiber, molecules move, uh, and they move a lot. And they can even leave the fiber, for example, and then re-enter the nanostructure at another site. These orange uh, structures and the silver background has two different signals for two different receptors on, on your cells, on, on neurons and then other cells of the central nervous system. 
And, this, and you see there at the bottom what these, these uh, signals do. The orange one grows new blood vessels. It's like magic, right? So there are no cells used. There are no proteins. It's just chemistry. It's just molecules. And they make blood vessels grow. They help myelinate the axons that are ruptured during spinal cord injury. They also uh, uh, will save motor neurons after the injury. They'll help sell them. And then the gray one uh, reduces the scarring of the, uh, in, in the site of injury and also promotes the regeneration of the axons of neurons, which have cell bodies in your brain, and then they descend through your spine into the spinal cord. So anyway, the, the, we got a lot of attention with this work, and, and I just like this uh, BBC World News report because <laughs> Of, in the it's the first time I heard about the dancing molecules, in humans and with a British accent, which is nice. In mice. The drug was injected into their spinal cords, and the mice learned to walk again within four weeks. The injection encouraged molecules in the spinal cord to dance, dance. promoting nerve regeneration. Yeah, anyway, <laughs> to dance. Okay, <laughs> so, so then uh, that in that their main dancing molecules. But I, I think this is great. It's a happy image. Now, why is this dancing important? Well, uh, the, the reason is that the receptors on cell membranes are moving like that, okay? They're not static. You know, 20 years ago, we weren't thinking that way. But these receptors are moving uh, on the membrane. They are extremely mobile. And, and the signals that our nanostructures are trying to uh, uh, promote to trigger uh, have to then chase after these moving proteins in order for them to signal. And so that's why when the individual molecules move, right, then uh, when they move internally, when they have specific motions, they are better able to reach out to the receptors and signal. Okay? So the probability of signaling we found uh, goes up when there is more dancing, when there is more movement, and we figured out a way to molecularly encode in the nanostructure this motion. So we change the chemical structure, and things either move a lot or move very little. And, and then I said, I want to try this in the most difficult regenerative medicine target there is, which is spinal cord injury is the, the devastating injury of, of paralysis. And we did. But we started in vitro. And so if you look at this, which I think is really remarkable, these are human, human neural stem cells. And our fibers, with a specific signal, are able to get these human neural stem cells to differentiate into neurons. You see the neurons here in white, and then the red and green cells behind them are neural stem cells, and then the neurons are in white. But here you see just like one neuron. Here you see a lot of neurons. What's the difference? The molecules here move very slowly, and the molecules here move very fast. I was really amazed to discover this in the lab. So, Mo molecules move, you get neurons. Molecules don't move, the neural stem cells just sit there. This is very powerful. I mean, this is molecular power. It's supramolecular power, actually, to be more exact. The motion can be predicted by uh, computation. So this is slow motion, this is fast motion. And, and so that was in vitro. But then, uh, this is the in vivo model, so we injured a mouse to, so that it would become like paraplegic, you know, paralyzed completely. And within 24 hours, we deliver the, uh, the, the nanofibers, which start in solution. And then when they get to the spinal cord, by design, they become this hydrogel, and they sit there into a network, right? This histological view is unprecedented in the world. Uh, combined with the functional improvement that we saw. And so what you are seeing here is, is basically the, uh, the, the spinal cord histology. And 
uh, you see the, the, the thing to focus on is this, this pink thing. So this line is the site of the injury, of the spinal cord injury, right there. And, and the pink is the regenerating axons that are coming from cells that sit in the brain. So we were able to pass this line, so there's pink there, and only when the molecules moved, and then when the molecules did not move, this regeneration stopped just short of that midline, which is remarkable. And, uh, and then uh, we, uh, now I'll show you the model. He, this is sort of the paraplegic mouse, right? And so basically, uh, and you see there's complete paralysis in the hind limbs, okay? Uh, and and this, this injury can happen to any of us at any age, you know, from car accidents, from sports injuries, accidental falls, gunshot uh, shot injuries, explosions, tumors in the spinal cord. I mean, this is really something that can happen any time in life. And it's a devastating injury. And it, solving this problem implies that we can also think to how to repair the brain better after a stroke or uh, after brain injury or when there is neurodegenerative disease. So here is the comparison. I thought I would just put it side by side. The mouse on the left was injected 24 hours later after the injury with the nanofibers that are identical except that they have different chemical structure. They move little. The ones on the left move fast. And, and so you can see um, uh, the, um, the difference. Oops, sorry. Let's see if I can get it to the start. Oops, can I, let's see. Oh, there we go. Okay, now do look at the remarkable difference between the left and the right. The repair of the, of the mouse on the right is, is amazing. <laughs> Is, is, is basically ability to walk again. The one on the left just barely moves the limbs. The difference is the movement of the molecules inside the nanofiber. I've been going around the world recently to, at meetings on spinal cord injury, and one of the things that's phenomenal is that this is a devastating injury where patients are so, they are so devastated by their condition that they go to all the science meetings uh, where scientists talk about uh, possible solutions and they are engaged. Uh, uh, there was one really great meeting in London that I, I attended in September and another one in, in Salt Lake City. Patients come and patients write to you and patients do anything to try to understand what scientists are doing and to see how they can uh, motivate us more and more to get things done. So these are the people that do everything in my lab, and I'm very thankful to them for their great work. But I have to very specially acknowledge uh, funding uh, from the Porosnak family uh, where, because we have received a gift uh, from this family just a few months ago, and, and, and the money that we received is so that we can take all this science, this deep science, uh, to the clinic, and the, and the gift is specifically directed at that. And I am extremely grateful, and I will, of course, uh, spend uh, the time of the rest of my life fighting to get uh, a solution uh, to spinal cord injury and brain repair. So this is my story, and I'm going to invite my colleague Guillermo, who is probably here, the guy from Panama, okay? And, uh, and, and Guillermo is going to tell you about uh, the way that he works uh, within the regenerative medicine uh, space. He calls it regenerative engineering. That's right. And That's so right. enjoy. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> so again, congratulations to, to Chad and to IIN and, and their 20 years. And thank you for the, the invitation. So what I'd like to do is uh, follow up but also on what uh, Sam said, but also acknowledge that Northwestern is, in fact, a leader. They're the first at everything. 
Uh, Chad was the first at, at these nano efforts. In fact, uh, uh, I'm the first person of color to ever be hired by a biomedical engineering department, and that was Northwestern, the first person of color to get tenured, and the first full professor in the whole country, right? Which is unbelievable. So I just had to mention that. And what I'd like to do also is uh, uh, continue this, in this, uh, this topic of we want to replace all of the synthetic stuff that you see in this side of the body with natural, normal biological tissues. And that is our goal. Uh, follow up on this side. I am from Panama, as, as Sam said. This is a tiny little place. I came from a middle to low income uh, family. Uh, very unusual circumstances uh, brought me to this uh, country, great country. Uh, very, uh, the odds are very, very small for this to happen, but in fact it can if you're determined. And I have to give a disclaimer because this is going to be public and I have to acknowledge that a lot of the work that I might talk about here today is in fact licensed or a commercial product, which is also a fantastic accomplishment in the field. For those of you that not, may, may not be familiar with Panama, it's uh, home of the Panama Canal, shown here, uh, an engineering feat. I am an engineer by training, as uh, uh, Evan Scott uh, described. Uh, this is the, the canal area. We see the, the waterways, a uh, nice hotel, beautiful place. I was just, in fact, there a day ago. I got back at 1 a.m. or so. But it's a, it's a big city, right? But if you ever visit, you definitely want to go. Not in the city. Don't stay in the city. You want to go to the beach, <laughs> right? So this, I, I didn't get a chance to go to the beach. I was at a scientific Technology and Science Congress, but my next time I'm, going, I'm definitely going to hit the sand. All right, so out of this tiny, tiny little place uh, where I'm from came uh, a variety of different firsts as well, similar to Northwestern. Ruben Blades, uh, those of you that may like music, he's the salsa pioneer. We got Roberto Duran, who is a boxing pioneer, uh, four champion in four different weight categories, 50 years uh, of, of a career. Uh, we've got a, a, I don't know if you like or hate reggaeton, but he's the founder of reggaeton, El General. Uh, we call it reggae, Spanish reggae, but he, he, he started it all, and Puerto Rico took it over. And then we've got uh, baseball greats, such as Mariano Rivera, right? He's, he's a, the best closer ever. Two Hall of Famers. Before him, it was Rod Carew. And of course, now my, my little self here, <laughs> hopefully, as Sam says, what we call regenerative engineering. All right. Okay, so this guy here, he's got a lot of beatings, a lot of beatings, right? So uh, when that happens, you can break your fist. Boxers break their fist quite often. Now, the aim here is to try to repair these types of injuries. That's what regenerative engineering is all about. Sam talked about soft tissues. I'm going to give an example of how we're trying to do this with hard tissues. Similar to uh, uh, other uh, sports athletes, such as Mariano Rivera, he tore his ACL in his knee which is a very terrible injury, can end careers. And, and let's, let's think about this. What do we do when we tear a, a joint, a ligament in a joint? Unfortunately, it's ever happened to you. This is the joint right here. This breaks due to unusual movements. What they try to do is reconstruct what you have here using a source from a different part of your body or from a donor, cadaver donor. And they try to secure it with devices. Oftentimes, those devices are screws, typically metal screws. And unfortunately, those devices stay in your body. They stay in your body forever. This is an example of, a, of an x-ray where you can see, sort of see the screws shown here. Why do we need to use metal screws? Well, that makes sense. If you're a carpenter, you want to fix things, this is what we do. And that, if to the orthopedic surgeons in the audience, please forgive me, but it's a lot of it is carpentry, right? But we want, to, we want to give them better tools to avoid this kind of problem. This is a ligament that was secured with a screw. And you can see the maceration, the, the tearing, how it destroys part of that ligament as you're screwing it into that tunnel. That is not ideal, needless to say. Here's another example. Well, let's not use a metal screw. Let's use a plastic screw. Those were developed within the last 20 years or so uh, using plastics that either slowly degrade or permanent ones. But they also can significantly damage that ligament as you're trying to get it into that tunnel, bone tunnel. Why do we need to do this? Well, again, you're trying to reconstruct that ligament tissue. And you also have to avoid problems such as this one shown here. This is an example where that device slowly made its way. It migrated out of the patient's knee. This is terrible, right? This is, they took the device out. That's it shown right there. That's the scar after they you know, sutured the person. 
This is another example of another patient where the screw slowly migrated out of the knee. You do not want this to happen to you. But this, is, this justifies the need for better ways to replace or re do that reconstruction so you don't have things migrating out of your body or causing chronic problems. So the grand challenge that I want to share with you, my passion, is this issue of how do we, uh, 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 how do we restore tissue function? How do we re regenerate tissue? Uh, it's uh, responsible for significant morbidity in, in our society, and that's at a very high cost. So the goal is to reduce uh, these types of losses. So we've identified several barriers to progress. And this is an, a summary of what we have uh, focused on over the last 20 years or so. The first is tissue dysfunction or scarring, which you're familiar with. Scar is good for you to heal quickly, but it may not give you that function back. And it also happens in, in nerve injuries. You don't get that function back. Technological barriers include the lack of materials that can promote processes within our bodies to regenerate itself. That does not exist. But there's also the society barrier. Somebody asked earlier on about, well, how do you disseminate this information? How do you educate us? That's also critically important, especially for our leaders, our political leaders. So before we even get there, we got to get through the regulatory approval process. We have to get through the user adoption process. So I'm going to focus on these last to give you examples of how we've been successful at that. Now, when you integrate or you combine engineering, medicine, and biological sciences, you get a new uh, area it's called regenerative engineering. And this area is effectively the convergence of advances that uh, Terry talked about earlier in material sciences, stem cell and developmental uh, uh, biology, also physical sciences and clinical translation to develop scalable tools, tools that would enable us to improve the outcomes of those types of surgeries. I want to focus on highlighting the scalable part because it's relevant to translation, relevant to taking technology or science out of the lab and into the communities. This is uh, the Center for Advanced Regenerative Engineering, which I, uh, I lead at, within McCormick, the first center of its kind to be housed in an engineering school, but have these type of collaborations within not only our medical school here at Northwestern, but throughout the Chicago area, throughout the Midwest. But also important are these relationships with industry, and Chad knows about this. So shown in red are several companies that have partnered with us for the educational requirements and needs that we have to educate the next generation of engineers and scientists that will be able to use convergence research, that deep integration of very different areas to achieve these goals. I'm going to highlight an example where we work with a company at Cordive Technologies to overcome this challenge of knee reconstructions or, or, or joint surgeries. So we've, over the years, we've performed research in many areas, raised over $20 million or so in, in, in funding. The center's just four years old, so it's a very new center, new, very new, exciting field. And these are the tissues that we've uh, uh, worked on, bladder, bone, uh, a nerve, pancreas. But also important, as I said, is the next generation, and that's what I'm about. I want to not only do my own work, but uh, you know, inspire others to, to join us. And these are our first and second cohort for our first training grant, the first one ever in the country, on regenerative engineering. It's a T32 sponsored by the National Institutes of Health. Uh, we have also programs for our undergraduate students here on campus, so talk to me afterwards if you're interested. It's called the Cure Club, Competition for Undergraduate Regenerative Engineering. And then we also have a program to encourage underrepresented minorities such as, uh, 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 like myself and others, not at all levels of, of your career, high school all the way through faculty, to join us in this very exciting field and research. This is a picture of them here. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the, 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 how do we address the path to clinical translation. I'll give you an example of how we've been successful at this. My, my, my advice to everyone is technology differentiation. You have to be different, you have to be unique in what you're doing, you have to make it clear. We do this at the academic level, but we also have to do it at the industrial level, what's called industrial validation and verification. I cannot take products from Northwestern uh, or technology or science out of my lab into the community. It's impossible. That's what industry does. Therefore, as an example, a quick story, we work with citric acid, very interesting molecule. It's found in ev effectively everything that we do in our daily lives. Uh, it's uh, made by our own bodies. It's actually produced by us. It's interesting because it can make, this is a chemistry talk in a way, so we can make very cool bonds. We can make materials that look like a net so we can make these net points using these functional groups. But also, it's very inexpensive, which is good for, potentially, for scale-up. 
readily available, and there's a history of safe use of this molecule in society. The next slide gives you an example of the types of uh, uh, applications, topics, materials, it, the ranges everywhere, skin products, food products, beverages. So it's a very safe molecule, that's the message here. When you take that molecule and you react it with either an amino acid, another alcohol, or for example, uh, uh, a vitamin, you can make materials. And we were the first ones to discover this. We can make materials that are either liquids or solids. These materials have very interesting properties. They can be antioxidant, inherently antioxidant. So your mom was correct when she said, take your vitamin C, take your vitamin E, she was completely right. And this is an example here where these green bars are basically scavenging or abstracting radicals, which can be very bad if they're in excess. They can lead to problems, inflammation, and so on. So these molecules or these materials are, are interesting because we were the first to show in vivo, in other words, in a, in a, human, in a living uh, system, that oxidative stress is also responsible for the, the deleterious or the negative effects that we tend to see uh, when you have these uh, reconstruction surgeries. Uh, now, this is an example. We can make elastic or rubber-like materials. They can, we can engineer them so that they glow. We can make hydrogels or, or gel-like materials that, that uh, change shape or phase with temperature. And we can make materials that are liquid, honey-like, that we use for 3D printing or additive manufacturing. And the example I'm going to show is the work that we do in convergence research. This is why convergence is very important. In this area, we converge bacterial sciences with mechanical engineering, cardiovascular engineering, and stem cell biology. In that area, we can see the generation of blood vessels in vivo, but also stents that degrade in time. These are not stents that stay in your heart forever or your legs forever. They actually go away and leave the blood vessel intact behind. We have an area where if you integrate or you converge uh, material sciences, dermatology, mechanical engineering, and electrical engineering, you can generate interesting technologies that can speed up how fast a, 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 a foot ulcer, if you're diabetic, heals to prevent uh, amputation. And you can also use strategies with electronics, which Professor Ro John Rogers will talk about later on today, to significantly speed up the rate at which they heal using electrical stimulation. This is an extremely exciting area. Now, the possibilities with electrical stimulation imply that we could do wireless communication with these types of devices. Now, in the, the third area, which is the convergence of material sciences, orthopedics, bi bone biology and stem cell biology, allows us to develop alternatives to those metal screws, to those plastic screws that are just not good for you. And the last two, the integration of endocrinology, transplant surgery, and material sciences, has allowed us to now restore islet function. Islets are the cells that produce insulin in order, in order for us to be able to use uh, glucose or sugar in, in our bodies. So we have work ongoing where we can transplant materials of these islets using these types of materials in the body in, that, that allows restoration of normal sugar control. And lastly, another very exciting area where you do convergence of bacterial sciences, stem cell and developmental biology, urology, and electrical engineering is a pretty cool, exciting project when we want to regenerate bladder tissue. Well, the bladder, nobody talks about it until you have to use it. It's a problem, right? But it's a very important organ. And in this case, we've, we're, we're, we're on our way to show that we'll be able to understand when the bladder's filling, be able to control its emptying. Uh, people with spina bifida, cancers, oftentimes they have to undergo bladder reconstruction surgery where they want to enlarge it. And unfortunately, it's the use intestinal tissue, which is terrible, right? So uh, intestinal tissue is not bladder tissue, lots of side effects, including cancer, stones, and other problems. The idea is to use these materials to restore that, 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 that function, but also integrate electronics. These are bio-integrated into the tissue. Professor Rogers is going to give examples of that later on, but this is going to also enable what we call smart regenerative systems. So the future is going to be able to not only implant something in your body and hope for the best, but implant it into your body, monitor what it's doing, get information about what's going on in its environment, send that information out to your doctor or caregiver, and potentially to your insurance company, to the manufacturer. If anything goes wrong, you don't have to wait for horrible deaths or pain and suffering. You might be able to predict, anticipate that using, for, for example, AI. So that's going to be the future of this area. And do it with diabetic foot ulcers, with bladder regeneration. Now, this is important. We have to make sure that we disseminate our information. You talked about this. We've done this over the time. This enables industry to step in. 
and look at technology. And in the case of ACL replacements, we've been successful at saying to, the, to, to our colleagues in industry, there's a better way. There's a better way than just using screws or plastics that just don't help the regeneration process. So looking at the convergence fields of material sciences, orthopedic surgery, and bone biology, we've been able to develop interesting materials as shown here, taking advantage of the fact that at the nanoscale, citric acid is critical to maintain your bone formation, maintain its stability, maintain bone health. This is new, also discovered based on our work. So the materials, the solution, let's talk about solutions. Pretty simple. This is a container with the polymer that we developed based on citric acid. This is a ceramic component. We were the first to be able to make materials that have a ceramic content similar to that of our own bone. Okay? We can cast it, we can mold it, we can machine it, we can basically process it in ways that are consistent with industrial practice. And we're also able to engineer these materials into uh, different shapes, different form factors. They can be as soft as bread, stuff as stone. And what's important, critically important, at the interface between a device and surrounding bone, there is no scar. There's no inflammation, there's no scarring. And this is good because scarring can inhibit function. So, in the case of bone cements, we've heard of issues with bone cements. If you have osteoporosis, your, your bones are very fragile. These materials can be engineered to be injectable. So imagine this, Not, no more use of basically super glue to repair your you know, broken vertebrae that have fractured because of uh, you know, debilitating bone conditions. Imagine something that's more of the consistency of honey or liquid that enables the surgeon to get it in right where they want it. However, once it's there, your body temperature cures that material into a solid that is as solid and has the same mechanical properties as bone itself, right? So that's the future that we're gonna be able to uh, head towards, and this work was published recently uh, through one of my, uh, my graduate students that is now a postdoc. But the idea here is that we talk about hydrogels as an example that Professor Stu mentioned for you know, very soft tissue repair. In the case of hard tissue repair, such as bone, we need materials that can be handled properly and that can be, you know, uh, uh, that support the function of that ultimate structure. And this is an example here, the person is gonna drill right through that bone here and no, no problems, no issues. So, uh, wrapping it up, and look, this is the histology here. This is degradation of the material. This is bone cement. It's currently basically super glue. This is our material. It slowly degrades, resorbs. This is new bone forming around the particles. This is the same bone cement that we currently use today. It does not degrade. It's just there. Very, very stiff. Now, uh, translation is very interesting. This is the company that took our work, worked with us, and now they identified that they had to reproduce everything that we did. They had to ensure that our work was unique and different in their hands. They had to validate all of the safety studies that we did in their hands, and they did that. And if you take an example of an X-ray of a, the screw that I showed earlier, those screws have very little ceramic, way below 20, 30% or so, and they're very big particles. Nanotechnology enables us to make materials that have particles that are in order of, and more similar to what we have in our bodies, bone, and at that composition of percentage that, again, is, is closer to the natural bone in our body, 60%. With that information, and this uh, uh, backs that up, this is what it looks like in current particles. You can clearly see particles here in, in the background. This is the polymer background. These are the ceramic particles. You cannot tell, right, that you have two phases here. That's how small the particles are. You just can't tell. This is important, why? Because we can make new types of materials with mechanical properties that are unique. This is what Dravid talked about earlier. We can compress these cylinders, deform them, and they'll recover from deformation. They get their original height or back. This is in contrast to what these other types of plastics do, where you compress them and they completely fail, they deform. Why is this important? Well, because these materials are also strong. Not only are they a little bit elastic they give, they're very strong, very similar to bone. This is the currently used plastics. This is cancellous bone up here, cortical bone up here. Now, with, now, once they established that these materials are unique and useful, potentially useful, they showed in animal models that they can also regenerate bone tissue, shown here. The, the dark red is new bone that's forming inside of this plug, as shown here, at six months. But this is without any evidence of scarring, as shown here. So now that we have a system that can regenerate bone, no scar, and, 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 and this has mechanical properties that are pretty unique, 
the company set out to create innovative designs for their types of screws. These screws are not typical in that you have to you know, use a screwdriver to get them in. They're, you tap them in. So in, they, in less than one revolution, these screws are in that bone tunnel. The strength to secure that ligament is a lot higher than currently used screws. It maximizes the pull-out strength. It prevents that laceration, that tearing that I showed you earlier of the ligament, so you no longer get this. You get something that's more normal, enabling that tendon to regenerate. And uh, that regeneration upon resorption is what I'm going to capitalize on. So this gives you what the example of the, the uh, ultimate goal is to have this, a natural looking bone tendon interface from this point here. And this is what we've achieved. There are several products that are being developed. We have uh, Stryker, that's a partner that adopted this technology, and this is what took us through the FDA a couple of years ago. There was a lot of news over this topic, but this is critically important for what we do here. And this is an example. The three medical products that were FDA cleared, first time ever, the materials of this type of chemistry went through this regulatory process, October of 2020, followed by two other materials. These are for reattaching uh, rotator cuff to your shoulder, uh, shoulder bone, shown here. Well, it was approved in 2021. And the other one were screws basically for the knee. So that said, I just want to play uh, this very short video uh, that Stryker prepared. They're the, they're the distributor and it sells under their brand where they show why, uh, uh, this, is, this is why they thought this was very important. What I said, they basically summarized it. New mechanical properties as it dis dis resorbs or degrades, it's releasing molecules that are good for bone health and bone re regeneration. It also has uh, structures that mimic that of the extracellular matrix, which is what we want. But most important, this is a visual of how it works. This is the ligament. As it degrades, we leave the structure behind. Great, so to summarize, this is the first time ever that something has happened in, in, in over a decade or so where we use new chemicals. It's extremely difficult to, for this to get through the Food and Drug Administration. Made in the USA, right here, this is the ingredient. We're very proud of this, implant materials, hydroxyapatite, and our polymer developed right here in our, in our lab. Uh, this is the first use of the material in New York City, in Staten Island, not New York City, Staten Island. It happened last year, the first surgeries to go into patients, and this was Pro profoundly moving, of course, when you see someone actually get reconstructed in their ankle using materials developed in your lab. So um, I want to, I have no stock in Stryker, by the way, disclaimer, despite what I said earlier. So I just want to show a research company that looks at stock and markets and companies looked at this work and looked at Stryker, and this was really moving. They looked at, they, looked, they, they, they considered the, the technology that they adopted as one of the reasons why they believe that that company, it's a billion, multi-billion dollar company, will do extremely well moving forward into the future. So I just want to end uh, by highlighting the fact that this is one of very few materials that are degradable out there but actually promote bone regeneration on, on the market. And this is a foundation for a new platform for this kind of work to take, uh, happen and, and take the field uh, in new directions by the trainees that we're trying to uh, develop. So I want to end here, and, and most importantly, of course, thank all the students, the postdocs, my colleagues, agencies, but most importantly, my wife. Without her support, I would not be here talking to you, so uh, she should be in knowledge as well. Thank you very much, and uh, happy to answer any questions. All right, uh, please join me in thanking Professor Stoop and Professor Amir for these really inspirational talks. We have time for maybe one very quick question. If anyone has a very quick question, please stand and request the microphone. Hi, I'm uh, Phil Hemkin from Abbott. I had a question, uh, Dr. Stoop, about um, adding recombinant human proteins with your nanofibers. I did research in intermediate filaments, and I think of all the great work done by Bob Goldman here at Northwestern in intermediate filaments. So have you added uh, 
recombinant human intermediate filaments like GFAP or Nestin or other intermediate filaments to your nanofibers to help in regeneration? Yes. Uh, is this on? Yeah. Yes, uh, thanks for your question. Yeah, we, we have. And, and so the, the molecules are either designed to signal the receptors directly or they are designed to bind specific proteins, which could be you know, recombinant uh, growth factors, for example, and signal via the protein. So we've done both approaches. Uh, the recombinant protein approach, we have used it uh, very successfully for bone regeneration and cartilage regeneration. The, uh, one bone would be BMP2, and for cartilage would be TGF-beta-1. So that's a viable approach. And, and what the fiber does is it amplifies the recombinant signal. So right now, uh, if you need spinal fusion, you get this product from Medtronic, which requires you to have a huge amount of recombinant protein to grow the bone. Because the side effects, Medtronic has been sued a number of times for the side effects. Our nanostructure reduces that dose by a factor of 1,000. And so it's basically almost like a physiological concentration of the growth factor. So we're very excited about that. Okay. We actually have time for one more question. If anyone has a question for Professor Amir. Hello. Uh, thank you both for these great talks. Um, I had a quick question about just the fact that whenever you implant a foreign body into the body, can create this site of inflammation that could be problematic to the actual efficacy of that material. So I was wondering if you see this in that research and whether or not you see this as like a general problem as a whole in this field. Yeah, so, so you are correct. Uh, you, your body will have a response to that implant. What we've done here, we've worked with that response, right? So we try to understand it. People like Dr. Scott, they look at immunology as, as their partner field in, in this convergence uh, approach. So in our case, uh, we have significantly reduced inflammation because of the antioxidant properties of the material itself. So it helps counter some of that. And the citric acid is also involved in how the stem cells uh, work or change in order to become a useful builder cell. So in that context, we see a lot less inflammation, a lot less of the scarring, as I showed earlier. There's no evidence of that happening, which is what effectively encouraged uh, companies to come forward and, and look at this in a serious way to see if could it be you know, produced in a large scale, you know, millions of units and so forth to help patients. Okay. Please join me in thanking the speakers one more time. <laughs> At this point, I'd like to have the session chairs, the speakers, and the executive council members please come to the stage for pictures. Uh, and in the meantime, we're going to have a very short break. Um, probably come back in about 10 minutes. Thank you.